and as is the custom. While you do so, I'll just recap what we covered last Sunday uh, to get us all back up to speed. So in uh, our last study of Galatians, when we last came together, we read through verses 6 through 10. And in these verses, we saw that Paul began reasoning with the Galatians and Judaizers from the Torah itself, which are the first five books of the Bible. Um, And specifically, he argued from the book of Genesis. And he proved that his audience has no excuse for being led astray from sound doctrine, uh, given the fact that in Genesis 15, what he quotes from shows that Abraham was credited righteousness through faith. And uh, this shows that the doctrine of salvation through faith was taught as early as Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And then in verse 7 of Galatians 3, Paul states that those of faith are the true sons of Abraham. And he makes a statement because those who are of faith exhibit the same faith that Abraham himself exhibited. And he makes a statement there because of that. And so the conclusion that he makes is therefore that the sons of Abraham, the spiritual heirs of Abraham, partake of the blessings that God promises through Abraham, effectively making them Abraham's spiritual children. And he gives the spiritual heirship or the spiritual inheritance of Abraham more supremacy than than he does the biological inheritance. And then we also went to Genesis chapter 22, which Paul also kind of alludes to. And in that chapter of Genesis, God promises that all nations of the world will be blessed through Abraham. So not just Israel, not just the Jewish people, but all the nations of the entire world. And so uh, Paul has shown that the Torah teaches salvation through faith and that Gentiles can be saved as early as the first book of the Old Testament. And, he's, and these are two propositions that the Jews not only believe, uh, believe were not true, but they also vehemently despised. And so Paul's argument shows the Jews that the book they hold dear, the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, teach two fundamental doctrines that they stand opposed to. And for our study today, We're going to work through verses 10 through 12, so the next three verses of Galatians 3, so verses 10 through 12, and really what these verses are going to kind of argue against is what Paul has just done in the prior verses we covered is raise this question in the Jews' mind, and now the kind of response that they might have is, well, you gave just one example in the Old Testament, so you picked probably the only example the Old Testament gives of salvation through faith. Um, And we don't even know if we agree with your interpretation of this verse at all. And so that's all you've got. You're just pulling at really, you're just pulling really thin here. And so you kind of pick that one little verse. And so if that's all you got, Paul, then you've got nothing. And so this, what Paul's going to do next is kind of show, is kind of make that response to that implied line of reasoning. And so I'll, to kick us off, I'll uh, start in verse 10 and read through verse 14. And Paul says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. For Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And I'll end that there. But Paul has now shifted his attention back to the law as the main subject that he's discussing. And he begins with the astounding statement that all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And probably the first thing that might come to your mind is that antithesis. So notice the contrast in subject matter between verses 6 through 9 and now verses 10 through 14. 
In verses 6 through 9, we're told of the righteousness of Abraham. That was the subject, the righteousness of Abraham. And now in verses 10 through 14, we're immediately confronted with the curse of the law. So now you have night and day. You have righteousness and curse. And the righteousness of Abraham contrasted with the curse of the law. So for Abraham to be of faith was righteousness, but to be of the law is a curse. And fortunately, Paul backs up this lofty statement by citing a source. And he says, for it is written. And then in your Bibles, you probably see quotation marks around the next phrase. And so what we see is that Paul is obtaining this word curse in this definition and this uh, information. He's using this from a source. He's actually quoting something here. And so to understand what Paul means, we really need to kind of understand the source that he's quoting from. We really need to investigate this quote. But whatever Paul is using here, it must be some sort of anti-Christian, unbiblical, heretical book. Because it's speaking so poorly of the law. And perhaps Paul's quoting from a pagan philosopher. Maybe a Neoplatonist or a Gnostic And likely it's something that surely the Galatians and the Judaizers don't have access to because the quote is so clear in its antagonism of the law. However, providentially, in your Bibles, you probably have, maybe near the middle of your pages or the far right or far left of the page, you probably have a list of cross-references right down the margin. And right down the middle. And if you follow those references until you find the ones associated with chapter 3, verse 10, you'll see that Paul is in fact not quoting from some pagan anti-Christian source, but he is indeed quoting from the Torah. Once again. And specifically, he's quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. Specifically, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. So flip over to that verse real quick and we'll take a look at it. Deuteronomy 27, 26. And while you're turning there for context, chapter 27 of Deuteronomy provides a series of various things or various actions that you'll be cursed for doing or performing. And this chapter primarily gives a summary of the laws that were provided already in the previous books of the Torah. So you look at Exodus and Leviticus. Um, And as your eyes scan down through chapter 27, you'll see a curse for one action after another. And if we start in verse 24, we'll see some examples of what these actions are that you'll be cursed for. So uh, chapter 27, verse 24, um, God through Moses says, Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. And so you'll recognize verse 26 as the verse Paul's quoting from in Galatians 3.10. But you'll also, looking at this whole chapter in chapter 27, you'll also recognize that verse 26 is largely summarizing and concluding the entire chapter of Deuteronomy 27. Because he's basically saying, um, his conclusion is, if anyone doesn't do anything that I just said, then they're cursed. And so chapter 27, a summary is, cursed is someone who does this. Cursed is someone who does that. Cursed is someone who does A, who does B, who does C. And then verse 27 is used to carry home the point. Um, And so the the idea here is, it's Moses is saying, it's a sin to do this, it's a sin to do that. And do you see where I'm going? Do you get my point? It's a sin to disobey any command of the law. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of the law by doing them. And I like the chapter, this chapter in particular in Deuteronomy, because it really affirms the whole point of Deuteronomy. Um, and even the name itself, because Deuteronomy, it comes from the Latin, Deutero, which means second, and Namos, which means law. So the translation from the Latin is second law, or repetition of the law. And it's a repetition of what, because it's a repetition of what the Israelites were told to obey. 
in Exodus and in the book of Numbers. And the reason Deuteronomy is a second repetition, the reason that repetition of the law was needed is because of the 40 years that, uh, the 40 year gap in the book of Numbers between Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So 40 years had passed since the original provision of the law. And so now you had almost an entire generation of Israelites that have now died. Or you have a generation of Israelites who were incredibly young or infantile whenever the law was first given. And so now we go into Deuteronomy and you need that repetition of that law that was already provided to them in the book of Exodus and in the book of Leviticus. And so now, now we have Deuteronomy, second law, second time the law was provided. And so here in Deuteronomy, Moses is repeating, he's reemphasizing, and he's commenting on the laws that were already given to the prior generation, reminding their children of its importance before they, were ta- before they tried to take over Canaan in that great military uh, advance. And the staggering conclusion that Moses reaches after he finishes all of this is that one concise sentence of cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of the law by doing them. And so that said, you may have noticed that Paul's commentary of this verse in Galatians 3.10 is a teeny bit different from how it's presented in Deuteronomy 27.26. In Galatians 3.10, what Paul comments is, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. What Paul does is take Deuteronomy 27.26 to its logical conclusion. He's taking it to its logical end point. If everyone who doesn't obey the law is under a curse, like Moses states, then everyone is under a curse. Romans 3.23, Paul again says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No qualification. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So if everyone who doesn't obey the law perfectly is under a curse, and if everyone has sinned, then that means no one has obeyed the law perfectly. And therefore, the logical conclusion is that everybody is under a curse. Well, sort of. That's not exactly what Paul says here. It's true that everyone has sinned and no one has kept the law perfectly, but notice that Paul does not say everyone per se is under a curse, at least in the ESV translation. Because in Paul's quotation of Deuteronomy 27-26, The people under a curse are those relying on works of the law. That's how the ESV translates it. But interestingly, the word translated as rely in the ESV is not present in the Greek text. It's something that may be implied, absolutely. But it's not actually there. And so if you're reading in in an ASB, a King James Version, a New King James Bible, one of those uh, very literal translations, you will see that word rely omitted. And they'll, in the English, they read more as, for as many are of the works of the law are under a curse, instead of as many who are relying on the works of the law are under a curse. And I think that's probably the better way to look at this verse, as it's more what is implied in the Deuteronomy passage itself. Um, I think to translate it with the word rely is jumping the gun just a little bit. Um, It's not theologically incorrect, absolutely, it is correct, and it's Paul's ultimate point. Um, But I find it more helpful to translate it as for those who are of the works of the law are under a curse. Because that does a better job of delineating how dire the situation actually is. It's not just those who are consciously relying on the works of the law the law, but rather everybody who is of the works of the law is under a curse. And another reason it's helpful, to, I think, to keep that translation is because right after Paul makes this statement in verse 10, he quotes the passage verbatim from Deuteronomy 27, 26. And I point that out because that tells us how Paul interprets the passage. When Moses says, cursed be everyone who doesn't obey the law perfectly, what Paul is actually saying in the Greek is, yeah, so what that means is that all of us are cursed. That everybody is cursed. So Paul's reminding his readers who are so zealously, who so zealously look to their work for salvation that Moses himself told the Jewish people 
it's not just about obeying the law one time. It's not about obeying it twice, or three times, or four times. It's not about obeying it 10,000 times. It's about obeying the law every time, nonstop, consistently, with zero room for error. And not that I believe this is possible in practice because of how sinful we are, but in theory, you could obey the law a million times perfectly in a row from the day you're born up through the day you turn 87. And then one day you stub your toe and in anger you use God's name in vain. And now you're doomed. You've ruined it. That streak is just wrecked. It's destroyed. It's gone. And so now you've broken the law and stand guilty before God. And obviously sin is a lot deeper than that, and that's a surface level example, but, but that's the point, right? The law demands perfection. It demands absolute perfection. It doesn't matter how many times you have obeyed it. If you've disobeyed it once, then that's enough. And so it's as if Paul's telling the Judaizers, Moses, the author of the Torah, told us that we must obey the law perfectly. Moses, the giver of the law. And so, are you telling me you've done this? Are you telling me, to the Judaizers, to the the Galatians, are you telling me that you've never missed a sacrifice? That you've kept all the cleanliness laws? That you've never worn these mixed fabrics? That you've never looked at a man or woman you're not married to with lust? That you've never coveted? That you've never lied? Do you really expect me to believe this right now? Are you this arrogant or foolish as to claim that you are perfect? Because you've only got two options here, and that's what Deuteronomy 27, 26 is really pointing out. That your only two options are you either claim that you're perfect, or you admit that you're under a curse and the law can't save you. That is a true dichotomy. That is the only two options that you've got here. And to the Galatians, he's saying, if any of you are trying to tell me that you're perfect, that's a problem. And this, this, whole, this reminds me of, the, of a quote, too, because it's, um, I was sometimes imagine saying, if any of you are trying to tell me that you're perfect, then let's just go talk to your spouse real quick and see what they have to say about this. And I, and I can't remember who this quote is by, but um, I, I heard it once said that the reason the Roman Catholic Church prevents the Pope from getting married is because if he were married, then he'd know he weren't perfect. Because the institution of marriage is just such a great sanctifying tool. <laughs> but, but that's the box that Paul really has trapped his audience in. That you're either perfect or you're not. That you hear you have to claim that you're perfect. You have to tell me, like, look at me in my eyes and tell me that you're perfect. Or tell me that the law can't save you. That's all you've got. And then that leads us seamlessly into verse 11 of Galatians chapter 3. And so now Paul says, now it is, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Why is it evident? Well, because of what he just said. It is evident that no one is justified by the law because of what he just said in verse 10. No one has kept it perfectly. So the evidence for justification through faith is the law. The evidence for justification through faith is the law. The law itself proves that we have to be justified through faith. That's all we've got. And he capitalizes and reinforces this proposition by quoting another scripture verse. Quoting, the righteous shall live by faith. And now the last verse that Paul quoted was from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. But what about this verse? Isn't this one from Romans 117? Is he quoting himself here? And if you're thinking that, then you're partially correct. Uh, Paul does say this in Romans 1.17, but when he said it in Romans, he's still just quoting it. Because 
the quote itself, again, if you look back to your cross-references here, <clears throat> the quote itself comes from the Old Testament again, and this one comes from Habakkuk 2.4. And you can flip over there. But Habakkuk is a minor prophet. And Habakkuk is, or Habakkuk is really a, a unique book among the, the prophets and even the minor prophets too because um, it's kind of like a, it's like really a question and answer format almost um, in this book. And uh, Habakkuk was just getting frustrated ultimately because of all of this wickedness that was prevailing and existing within the reigns of all those wicked, uh, those wicked rulers. So in that period of First and Second Kings, um, Habakkuk was just getting kind of mad. It's like all these kings and all these evil people, they're just sinning left and right, and everyone is getting killed, everyone is getting massacred, and we've got all these sins, everyone's disobeying you. How much longer are you going to allow this to happen? How much are you going to be patient with these people? And so really the theme, if you want to even put a theme to, to Habakkuk, a lot of it has to do with faith. A lot of it has to do with patience. And in Habakkuk 1, the prophet is actually making complaints against God for not addressing evil and sin and darkness of the age. And he's essentially angry that God is using Babylon to punish Judah. But then in chapter 2, uh, the chapter Paul is quoting from, Habakkuk says he will wait for God's answer to the question he has raised for him, um, which is a really arrogant thing to do, uh, to complain about how God is handling a situation and then sit and wait for him to answer you. Um, but God answers him nonetheless. And in chapter 2, verse 4, we have God's response, which is, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. And so the verse itself in context is a reference specifically to Babylon or its king. Um, but God is contrasting the evil lifestyle of the pagans to that of the righteous. Since God is telling us the evil of Babylon, we can take that specific example and apply it to the general population of anyone whose soul is puffed up and anyone who is relying on themselves and who does not have faith. So the passage then tells us how anyone who is righteous lives, and they live through faith. But notice the relationship between the words and the sentence, because this is really indicative. This is really an indicative phrase. Um, it is providing a description of the righteous. Those who are righteous live by faith, which shows us that faith is evidence of righteousness. So if you are righteous, if you are holy before God, if you are regenerate, then you exhibit faith. You live through faith. You trust in God. You believe on him for salvation. And that, uh, that faith, that trust, that is the outward display of your inward righteousness. You trust in God's knowledge. You trust in his will. You trust in his might. You trust in his mercy, and you throw yourself upon him. And further, the verb form for the phrase shall live in the Hebrew is really an imperfect conjunction, meaning that it's really identifying that phrase as an incomplete action. And what that means is that the action itself is incomplete, so it's ongoing. It is something that will continue. So those who are righteous, even in this passage in Habakkuk 2.4, and he's quoting God, so this is God speaking, that God is saying that this faith here, that this process is incomplete. It is something that must be ongoing. It is something that continues. And so if we take that, that concept, and we conclude here that based on this, right, the righteous will continually exhibit faith in God. And if we apply that now to our Galatians, or, uh, pa Galatians passage in chapter 3, what we see is that Paul has quoted from one of the prophets, and we now know what that quote means. And so what Paul has again showed us is there's more than one example. 
in the scripture. So number one, we see that in Deuteronomy, if you don't live every, if you don't live your life perfectly, if you disobey the law just one time, if you don't keep it just once, then that's enough to condemn you for eternity. And then he gives somewhat of a resolution for us by then turning around and quoting Habakkuk 2.4. Because now, if the Galatians are reading this in Deuteronomy, they're saying, well, that makes sense. I'm familiar with that quote. And what Paul is saying makes a little bit of sense, that if I haven't kept the law perfectly, then I am condemned. But what is my solution? Paul doesn't quote from the New Testament. He doesn't give them some kind of logical resolution he instead quotes again from the Old Testament, giving them that resolution. So the Old Testament created or displays the problem, the need for salvation. It shows them the problem of the law, and the Old Testament gives the solution to being unable to keep it. And so in Habakkuk 2.4, one of the prophets, that's where the solution is, and that's what Paul quotes from. And he says, the righteous shall live by faith. So you've got problem and solution both in the Old Testament. You've got a perfect soteriology right here. You don't need Romans. Romans is great, but everything you need is right here. And that's what Paul is trying to show them. And now we move to verse 12 in Galatians chapter 3. And in verse 12, Paul tells us, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. A rather short, terse phrase, but also very, very dense. So Paul confirms that the law is not of faith. And that's, I think, fairly obvious based on his quote from Habakkuk he just used and based on Deuteronomy 27, 26. But um, when we add that Habakkuk text to the context here in Galatians, we once again see a contrast between the righteous and the Judaizers. The Judaizers live by the law, but in Habakkuk 2.4, God says the righteous live by faith. It's two different things. Um, even in the, even in chapter, or even in uh, the book of John that Pastor Weber's going through, we see the Pharisees' zealousness for the law. We see the Jews' zealousness for the law. That's all the questions are about when they confront Jesus. It's all about, what do you have to say about this in the law? What do you have to say about that in the law? The law, the law, the law. Same thing for the Jews. But Paul is saying, the, the Bible never says, the Old Testament writings never say the righteous live by the law. Never once in the Old Testament writings, never once in the books of history, in the Torah, or in the prophets, do we see that the righteous live by the law. Do the righteous obey the law? Absolutely. Absolutely they obey the law. But that's not the source of their righteousness. That's not the source of their salvation. And Habakkuk 2.4 shows that. Because if the righteousness, if the Pharisees were correct... If the Judaizers were correct in focusing so narrowly and closely on the law, and if they were correct in identifying salvation in the law, then what Habakkuk 2.4 would say, but the righteous shall live by the law. The righteous shall live by obedience. But that's not what it says. It says the righteous lives by faith. And that is, and again, it's not a hidden Illuminati kind of text. It's very clear. It's very out there. It's very blatant. It's very obvious. But now in verse 12, you'll probably, you'll, you probably have the hang of it at this point. And, and once again, you notice that there were quotation marks again around what Paul's saying in verse 12. And so now... Hopefully your eyes naturally drifted to the margins to look at the cross-references of what Paul quotes, where he says the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. You'll see quotes around that last part. And you won't be surprised, but this quote is again from the Old Testament, specifically from Leviticus 18.5, another book of the Torah, just like the... Deuteronomy was. So if you want to flip there real quick to Leviticus 18.5, we'll start to unpack this scriptural reference. Leviticus 18.5. 
And while you flip there, just remember, too, that the book of Leviticus is largely a book of laws, right? So the, the Levi's were, uh, the tribe of Levi was the tribe that God entitled the priesthood to. And so Leviticus, the word Leviticus comes after the word Levi. So Leviticus means of Levi. Levi is the tribe of the priests. And so this is the book of laws concerning, uh, concerning the tribe of Levi and concerning all those kinds of laws that Israel was to follow. And so chapter 18 falls within a series of chapters in which God is providing laws to follow. And chapter 18 in particular is focusing on laws about sexuality. And God gives a short preface before going into those laws. And verses 1 through 5 are the preface. And so I'll start us in verse 1 and we'll read through verse 5 to the verse Paul is quoting from. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Well, in that there, that's the verse Paul is quoting from, verse 5. And what God is doing here is he reminds the Israelites once again for the upteenth time to obey him and to obey what he is about to say. And as we saw in Deuteronomy, he's going to do it again. But that way they will be righteous, that the Israelites will be righteous and show themselves as distinct from the nations around them. And verse 5 is where Paul is quoting from here. And so interpreting verse 5 within the context of Leviticus, we must remember the covenantal context of Leviticus as well. There's, there's a couple interpretive difficulties with, with this verse. And so um, just to, to lay them out here, Leviticus is, is a covenantal book. And it's a covenant between God and the nation. And it is specifically set up um, the specific kind of covenant is a suzerain vassal covenant, which is a covenant used in the ancient Near East customs between a stronger party and a lesser party, and in which the stronger party provides protection and land to the lesser party in exchange for loyalty. And so in the suzerain vassal covenant that Leviticus describes, Israel is told that if they keep God's laws, they will enjoy covenantal blessings and fellowship with him. And as with a typical suzerain vassal covenant, these blessings were temporal and physical. The blessings of good produce in their vineyards, blessings of food, blessings of health, blessings of protection from their enemies, blessings of land. And when we read through the books of Joshua and Judges and the prophets and the books of Kings and, and even how it's listed in Chronicles, when we read through those books, we see that's true, that when Israel obeys, they do receive sustained temporal blessings. And when they disobey, they sometimes receive physical punishment. Not all the time, because God is merciful and he has withheld his hand from punishing them multiple times. But ultimately, when they disobey, they do go into covenant or punishment because they broke the laws of the covenant. And then that's what the ultimate peril was in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles when ultimately the Jews are deported to Babylonian and Assyrian uh, captivity. And so this passage in Leviticus... The question here, if this is a covenantal context, the question here is that, is this verse in Leviticus referring to the law as a means of enjoying this covenantal blessing? Is it referring to keeping the law as a way of obtaining salvation? Or both? Well, what's the best thing to do to interpret difficult passages? Well, you interpret them in light of the clearer passages. In other words, you interpret them with more scripture. And there's three New Testament references to Leviticus 18.5. Um, Galatians 3.12 is one of them. So there's two more. And the other two, or well, the first one, if you'll flip here next, the first one is Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 30. So Luke 10.25. And we'll go ahead and kind of look at this for a minute. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Um, This is the precursor to the story of the Good Samaritan, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. But I'll read through verse 30. So starting in verse verse 25, Luke narrates, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, being Jesus, to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to uh, to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. And so, very simple. In this text, we have a lawyer asking how we can obtain salvation. And Jesus asked him, Well, how how do you think? What do you think? You being a Jew, you interpret this for me. What do you think? And and he gave that that typical kind of Judaistic answer, keeping the law. Um, I got to love the Lord my God with all my strength and all my mind. i got to love my neighbor as myself. And that's a reference to that Leviticus passage, which is saying you've got to keep the law. You have to obey me. And so this person was interpreting it as a means of salvation, because that's straight up what he was asking. He asked, how can I obtain salvation? And Jesus asked, well, how do you think? And he said, well, I think I I get salvation by obeying the law. And Jesus said, yep, you're correct. Do it. And that, and that conversation pretty much ends. But then when we, if you look another verse over, in verse 29, the lawyer asks, well, who's my neighbor? The assumption is that there are only certain people who are his neighbor, and not everybody is his neighbor. And so that shows the, the lawyer's kind of internal disposition, that he lacks that level of sincerity, that he's not... He, the fact that he is only willing to love certain people and not everybody, the fact that he is only willing to show that level of decorum and respect and compassion for certain people is a display of his inward condition. It's really out of context. Yeah. It's just, it's just an example of people trying to get out. What, what is the least I can do to be right. obedient to God's work? Yep. Yeah. It was yeah. Sorry, check it off. Yeah. I'm just yep. That is all that is. It's pure legalism. And then Jesus, that's what leads him to the story of the great Samaritan. That even these Samaritans whom you despise, these Samaritans are your neighbors. But the next reference to this in the New Testament is Romans 10.5. If you'll turn there next. Romans chapter 10 verse 5. And in this passage, Paul tells us, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I'll end that there. But in the text, Paul clearly indicates that Moses is talking about righteousness. In Leviticus 18.5, that he's talking about righteousness based on the law. And so the answer there is it's probably both. That it's referring to salvation and referring to those physical covenantal blessings that they get from that kind of obedience. But the problem is that keeping the law was not a source of salvation. Rather, it was a response to the salvation that they were given. And that's what the Jews missed. That this obedience to the law is a response. It is a reaction to the internal change in my inward disposition. And so Paul is telling, basically he's saying that there are two ways to salvation. One is by keeping the law perfectly, and the other is through Christ. That's all there is. However, as we know, nobody can perfectly keep the law, and so the only way to salvation for us is through Christ, 
And now we know how to interpret Galatians 3.12 and Paul's use of Leviticus 18.5. And so when we apply this to our text in Galatians, we see that Paul, that what Paul is saying is that the law is not of faith. That's why Paul says that in verse 12. That's why he begins with that phrase. And then he uses scripture to back it up. He begins in verse 12 by saying the law is not of faith. And it's not of faith because it requires obedience by definition. Moses told the Jews they have to live by the law. And this is really close to what he said in Deuteronomy 27, 26. It's almost the same thing. Why did we do all that digging, though, to find out how to interpret that one verse? Because it's crucial to this text. It's crucial for Paul's line of reasoning. In verse 11, in Galatians 3.11, Paul makes two key propositions. Number one, or I guess verses 10 through 11, he makes two key propositions. Number one is that no one is justified before God by the law. Number two, the righteous shall live by faith. So based on these two propositions, we can tell why no one is saved by the law. If the righteous shall live by faith, and no one is justified by the law, then that would mean, just by deduction, that the law is not of faith, or else you would be able to get saved by it. But logically speaking, there isn't enough data there for that conclusion to be 100% squeaky clean, and Paul knows that. And so if we focus on that second proposition, that the righteous shall live by faith, as Habakkuk tells us, Since the righteous live by faith, in order to now show that the law cannot save them, what Paul has to do, logically, is he has to prove that the law is not of faith. If the righteous live by faith, then we now have to prove that the law is not of faith. If if we're trying to prove that, we can't be saved by the law. And that's precisely what Paul does by quoting this text in Leviticus 18.5. Leviticus 18.5 tells us that you can only be saved through the law if you keep it perfectly. And in Luke 10, 25 through 30, Jesus proves that that is the correct interpretation of it. And in Romans 10.5, Paul through the Holy Spirit also proves that that is the correct interpretation of it. So you've got two other sources in scripture that validate that interpretation. And what that does, though, is it makes Paul's argument completely sound. It is so sound that it can now be fully made into a syllogism. And and I've used that word syllogism quite a bit. And the reason I do is because Paul loves deductive logic. And a syllogism is really a component of that. And they're basically, it's basically a logical structure that consists of two premises and one conclusion. And the reason these are so important is because in deductive logic, if all three parts if all three propositions are true, then that means that the conclusion is 100% true without any kind of error at all or doubt. It is impossible for it to be wrong. And so that's why Paul now kind of bunches them together like this, because it means that it is 100% true. So here we go. If we bunch them together, proposition one, the righteous shall live by faith. We know that is true based on uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26. We know that's true on, by Habakkuk 2 specifically. Proposition 2, the law is not of faith. We know that is true because of Leviticus 18.5. Proposition 1, righteous shall live by faith. Proposition 2, the law is not of faith. Conclusion, no one can be righteous through the law. So the structure is like this. A equals B. C is not B. Therefore, A is not C. So it is an entirely sound, infallible, logical system. It's a deductive argument. And again, we got all three references from the Old Testament and two from the Torah. And what Paul has now done is he has used the Old Testament entirely to prove that salvation is through faith a completely infallible argument through the Old Testament writings. Didn't use a single New Testament epistle or book. And so what he's done now in verses 6 through 9 will show that Abraham, 
the patriarch of the Jewish faith, was saved through faith and reinforced the supremacy of his spiritual lineage over his physical lineage. So he gave those examples in 6 through 9. And then in verses 10 through 12, he's shown that that's not the only example, that there's more to it, that there's more to this story, and that we can use these verses in order to prove salvation through faith. But how many did he use? 3,000? 300? Just three. That's all it took. That's how plain it was. It didn't require any in-depth systemization or any in-depth piece-by-piece augmentation or anything like that. Just three verses. Because those three verses were so profoundly clear. They were not mysterious verses. But by the time Galatians was written, it had been thousands of years since those passages were written. That's thousands of years of Jewish sages, scholars, and students of the Old Testament that had come and went. Thousands of people devoting and dedicating their lives to studying the Old Testament. And yet hardly any of them had reached that conclusion. That took Paul just two verses in Galatians to prove. Why couldn't the Jews figure that out? It's not because they weren't intelligent. They were extremely intelligent. They were incredibly erudite. They were bright and brilliant men. But they couldn't figure out salvation through faith, not because they were dumb, but rather because they were blind. 2 Corinthians 4.3.4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It has nothing to do with the intellect. Is it intellectual? Yeah, it, it's certainly intellectual approaches the mind, but it's also the spirit. And so if you believe on Christ for forgiveness for your sins and for your salvation, then praise God that he's opened your eyes to the truth. But if that's not something you believe, then it is my prayer that you believe it. It is my prayer that you believe this day. And we pray to God on your behalf that he might open your eyes to this truth. Believe on him that you may be saved. And for those who do believe, may we not be so naive as to think that there are other areas of sins and doctrine that we're not blind to. So may we continue to study and may we continue to read and may we continue to search the depths of God that we may confirm and validate our understanding of God's word so that we may be pleasing to God not only in practice and not only in mind, but both. I'll end us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the the lessons that you've shown us in Galatians, that your word, what you have given us, is sufficient for salvation. That there is truly no excuse to not have knowledge of you, to not understand this incredible doctrine that your word teaches of salvation through faith. We love your word, we love your law, and we love all that we have learned and everything that we have been taught through the Holy Spirit's writing of this epistle. And we ask that you continue to show us and help us not just being holy in practice, but being holy in doctrine, being holy in both areas. May our Christian walk be exemplified by that completion, by that wholeness, by being holy in practice and in knowledge. Father, we ask for you to bless the next stage of our worship today. We ask that you bless our pastor as he comes before us to proclaim your word. We ask that you empower him by your spirit to proclaim your truth to us and that by the power of your spirit you empower us as well as we hear and as we listen bless our minds 
bless our spirits and bless our lives. And we also ask that we take these truths and that we take what we learned today and what we have been refreshed with today and may we go out to a lost and dying world and proclaim that. May we proclaim it to our families, to our spouses, to our children, to our parents. And may we go out and proclaim it to the rest of this world. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.